Okay, so there are still a few people um, joining us from the waiting room. It does take a minute or two just to come through, but in the interest of everybody's time and trying to sort of stick to the plan, I think we will make a start. So I just want to say thank you all very much for joining us today. My name is Sharon Young. I'm from the Design Capital team and I'm joined by my colleague um, Amanda Carson from Design Capital and she'll be helping later in the session whenever we start to do a little bit of Q&A um, and when we interrogate Nick. Um, so um, the format is that I'm going to introduce Nick. He's going to talk through his, um, the, the use your brand voice to say stuff that matters and then at the end we will have some time for questions so what I would encourage you to do is to put your questions in the chat as we go along um, and then Amanda and myself will pick those up at the end so I'm really delighted that we have Nick Parker from That Explains Things here today he's multi-talented uh, creative director, magazine editor, keynote speaker, one-time Viz cartoonist, um, bad trumpet player it says on his website. I haven't seen the, heard the evidence of that so I'm not sure and he's also author of um, The Exploding Boy and his most recent book on reading. So I am going to now hand over to Nick and uh, take it away. Thank you. Uh, thanks Sharon. Hello everyone. Um, it's like doing a radio show, isn't it? Like I sort of know you're out there, but I can't see or hear you all. So I'll just sort of take it on faith. Um, I'm a writer. I've always been a writer. Um, um, most of my work now is with brands and businesses. Um, <laughs> I say officially helping people find their voice, tell their stories and explain their things, whatever those things are. Um, and so I do it with a whole range of clients. So, you know, some of them sort of big or international like Tesco or booking.com and uh, some, uh, you know, small businesses and little startups. And I'm particularly interested. So I think so partly where this conversation started was how a brand writes, how it gets its personality into its words is obviously super important. I think it's a superpower for small businesses, uh, digital brands, uh, basically, just as a way of sort of punching massively above your weight, trying new and interesting things out. Um, so I mean, that's sort of what I'm going to talk about for the next half an hour or so. Really, what I'm going to do is just show you some interesting words that I've collected, um, either from my clients or just the stuff that people have sent me or that I see around. Uh, and along the way, you might find something that sparks an idea or seems interesting to you. Uh, if it prompts a question, stick that in the chat and we'll talk about it at the end. Um, as Sharon said, so I started my writing life writing uh, scripts for the radio and cartoons for Viz magazine. Like, so you might know Viz or you might not. Somebody said the other day, oh yeah, I think my dad reads Viz, which is sort of like, that's about its cultural presence these days. But sort of in the late 80s, early 90s, it was one of the biggest magazines uh, in, certainly in the UK um, and had millions of subscribers and the reason I'm telling you about this is because of the weird connection with Viz then and the work I do now. Um, so Viz was a sort of funny, rude, satirical uh, magazine with lots of cartoons that were sort of spoof of like the Beano and the Dandy and sort of 50s sort of cartoons and when I wrote my wrote and drew my very first cartoon strip and sent it to them before Viz would pay me they sent me a contract that I had to fill out um, it looked like this uh, it was called the green form it was white um, and it had this box that was about VAT um, I don't know if you can see this. It says, uh, if you agree to the offer below, please sign one copy of this agreement and return it to us at the address above. Keep the other in a safe place for your own reference. If you are registered for VAT, please enclose a VAT invoice when returning the form. If you aren't, you don't want to be, I can tell you. It's a bigger pain in the ass than piles. Um, <laughs> and I, re I remember thinking, are they allowed to do that? Like, isn't this like, you know, this is from accounts or legal or something. This is like an official thing. And then I said, like, oh, of course, because they're viz and they're rude and stupid. And they're rude and stupid, even in the tiny little bits of writing. 
that maybe like you know 20 people a year see this but they've even bothered to be rude and stupid here as well and obviously you know this was like the early 90s i didn't think oh what a distinctive and consistent tone of voice viz have but that's exactly what it is and it sort of planted that idea for me of of that looks like a fun job of uh, doing the writing, but also doing the writing uh, in unexpected places that people will remember. And uh, so obviously then promptly I went off and worked in magazines for about 10 or 12 years and didn't do any of this at all. And sort of ended up when working with brands, like thinking about this sort of stuff quite often, like where are the little details that you can make an unexpected and memorable difference? And that's basically what I do is I like now I help brands think about that stuff. And I collect examples of people who do it really well. Um, let me show you what I think is the best bit of writing I've ever seen in my life. This is from Griffin, Georgia in America. It's a road sign. So imagine you're driving along, all of a sudden you see this sign. Which, <laughs> I've no idea how you're reacting to it. I'm going to assume that you find it funny, because I do. Um, I like this for a few reasons. Firstly, like it's super helpful. Like the standard sort of British version of this, you see is a little red triangle with maximum height, three meters stuck on the bridge, which suddenly realizes in the wrong place and is too complicated. Um, I also really like, it's got a really strong voice. When, um, when I read it, what I hear in my head is, if you hit this sign, you will hit that bridge, you idiot. Like it really makes you feel like this has happened a thousand times before. Um, there's a sort of weariness to it, which I love. Um, and it's also a great reminder to me, actually, like even really unassuming bits of writings or things you've read a thousand times before. Uh, if we stop and think about it, there is always a way to make them more effective, more memorable and just have loads more personality. Um, I've been showing this sign in workshops for a few years now. And <laughs> last year I decided I'd track down the guy who took the photo just to say thank you to him. Um, and I did. And he said, uh, amongst other things, that the bridge has now been demolished because uh, it was genuinely really dangerous. But the townsfolk of Griffin, Georgia, have kept the sign and put it in pride of place in their town museum because it's their tone of voice, they say. Like, we're really straightforward people. We don't take ourselves too seriously. I just love that. Like, one road sign is the tone of voice for like, an entire community. So, well... And then I'm just always keeping my eye out. And it's always interesting where you see writing grab your attention like this. Sometimes, you know, this is a big, big massive sign above the road. Sometimes it is in quite unassuming places. Uh, this is from a hotel in Barcelona uh, <laughs> from the time when we could travel. Um, so I checked into this hotel. Um, I did what I always do when I check into a hotel is I go up to the room, go into the bathroom, like, right, what is it that I can steal? And there was this soap on the shelf. This is the cutest soap that you will steal from a hotel. Enjoy it. Amazing quality shower gel, rarely found as hotel amenity. And again, I just love this. This is like a massive opportunity to take something very dull and <laughs> reasonably low quality and turn it into something really memorable. Um, I also think it's a great reminder of, you know, we quite often as writers say, um, you know, put yourself in your reader's shoes you know that you know have empathy with what your reader is thinking or feeling this is really specific and precise you know exactly where is your reader standing and what are they thinking at the very moment that they have your words in their hands i think that is a lovely way of thinking about you know what is the opportunity for my writing um somebody sent me this not long ago this is from um an online cheese shop called laffinage de fromage um and this is the letter they send you when they've posted uh, their cheese out to you, which I think it's fair to say the tone of voice is overripe. Hi, Hannah. Thanks for placing an order. Your order will be cut by hand whilst the soothing notes of Brian Adams, everything I do, do it for you, is played. We will place your cheese on its bed of super biodegradable watsits, which will provide the utmost comfort and protection on its pilgrimage ahead. Our heads will be bowed in silence before chanting, mostly in rhythm, sacred verses to ensure your fromage starts its journey enlightened before the box is placed on it. goes on and on. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, but just so much more lovely than uh, thanks for your order. It's on its way. Like a proper, like spotting a moment to do something really interesting. Um, 
another brand who have done this really nicely um, are Painter Jackets. I don't know if you know these guys. They make sort of limited edition short run hipster jackets that I'm always missing out on because I'm not up early enough to click on the order button. I think what's really lovely about them. So there's two care labels in their jackets. One is care of the jacket and one is take care of yourself. Wake up early, exercise first thing, drink good coffee, stop worrying, less screen time, read books, have a bowl of Cocoa Pops. Um, I think what's really interesting is um, more people share photos of the label on Instagram than photos of the jacket. I think that is just like, that is the opportunity by spotting where you can use your voice, do something really interesting. Uh, that's what people like talking about. Um, so I think the things I've shared with you so far have been sort of very lovely and warm. Um, this is particularly brilliant. This is from um, a grilled cheese van in, um, I think, New Jersey uh, in America that a friend of mine sent me, um, which is doing sort of deliberately the opposite of like most people are using their tone of voice to draw people in and create closeness. Uh, this guy uh, is doing it to deliberately put people off. It's the one dollar grilled cheese, no change given, sort out your own shit. Menu, grilled cheese, one dollar, that's enough. If you need a drink, go to the place that sells drinks. Get your wallets out, but don't get your hopes up. Uh, I just think this is fantastic. Like that idea of if a brand is a tribe, you attract the people who want to be in your tribe and you put off the people you don't want in your tribe. In which case it appears to be almost everybody who doesn't just want one dollar grilled cheese and nothing else. Um, but again, just brilliant, brilliant. Um, oh, look, it's Tony's Chocolate Only. So here's a brand who does great things with their voice. I think what's really interesting about this, like I found this on LinkedIn um, a few months ago. It's their employment agreement. So it's like your onboarding contract, uh, but they've taken the time to make the whole thing, thing feel really Tony's Chocolate Only. Um, you can follow it like a little story. It goes all the way around. Um, it looks like a game with arrows going different places. Um, the arrows just point in one direction. It's still just a list, but the whole thing feels super fun, really nicely designed uh, in their voice, uh, even the supposedly serious things. On a serious note, part one, you agree you'll handle confidential Tony's information uh, confidentially. Uh, P.S. We'll take a lovely mug shot of you and put it on a, on a mug. <laughs> um, and again, like people are sharing this hundreds of times on LinkedIn. I think that's absolutely brilliant. You know, they're not sharing even just the packaging or the marketing or the sort of big official messaging. They're sharing a tiny bit of internal HR process. Uh, again, that is, you know, creating a really great bond uh, with your customers and love for your brand by noticing the opportunity to do something unexpected. Um, Lemonade Insurance, again, are a brand who, um, I don't know if you know them, so they're originally in the US, now uh, increasingly in different countries in Europe. And their whole thing is to make um, home insurance as clear and transparent and easy, as simple and simple as possible. One of the things I really like about Lemonade is that they didn't start with the brand and then add products and services. They started with the thing at the very heart of what an insurance company does, which is the insurance policy. Uh, and they made the effort to completely rewrite the whole thing to make it as clear and simple and transparent as possible. And so the voice of the policy, which is you know the most difficult thing, usually with legal and compliance and regulation all over it, uh, they got the voice of the policy right, and then that became the voice of their brand. So just let me show you. Um, so this is this is the start of the actual policy. So this isn't the sort of you know the preemptive stuff or the marketing. This is like when you get scrolling through the actual detail. What's not covered in your policy? This policy covers your stuff up to a limit of ten thousand dollars a year for damages caused by fire or smoke, theft or vandalism, burst pipes or appliance leaks. Everything else, such as I lost it, my dog ate it, my kid dropped it, my power went out, my computer died, my roof is leaking, I overfilled my bathtub, or I had a wardrobe malfunction, aren't covered. You can add coverage for some of these things 
here. Um, like, A, like that is just super useful and effective and helpful. Like you get that as a user of insurance instantly. Oh, I get the difference between what's covered and what's not covered. I overfilled my bathtub, my power went out, I had a wardrobe malfunction. But you only get that quality of writing in this situation if you have your writer, your brand people, your proposition designers, your legal department, risk and compliance, all sitting around the table thinking about the same thing and pulling in the same direction. I absolutely love that. And that, again, it's like, you know, that's quite hard to do if you're a big organization. Uh, if you're a smaller company, you can do that much easier and much quicker. Let me, oh, I saw this this morning. I just stuck this in just because I thought this was really nice. So somebody recommended the brand Home Things to me. Um, that's the sort of thing I like. So they're sustainable cleaning products for your house. And the whole thing is you don't get you know, lots of plastic bottles. You get one set of small bottles and then they send you the tabs and you dissolve them in water and make your own stuff. Um, home Things, the world is bonkers. Single use plastic is everywhere. And someone paid Snoop Dogg to say the words taco to the chateau. Half of them, half of the bonkers stuff we love, the other half, not so much. Like, so great product great voice that doesn't fall into the usual sustainable products sort of earnestness. Um, but what I realized reading their site is they basically build a voice, built a voice around the word bonkers. So the world is bonkers. Then I signed up for their email. The first email came through home things, cleaning products that make sense. Hello, did you know that water makes up 90% of the household cleaning products? That's bonkers. And then turns out, when they send you your products, not that I've had one yet, what does it say on the box? Home things, the world is bonkers. I just thought that was a great example of something that is like, is totally there for the taking for all brands actually. Just what word out there can you really own? Uh, I thought that was lovely, bonkers. I get it, Ho like every time I think of home things now, I'm thinking of that word. So I hope this is making sense. I have no way of knowing, I? I'll just keep talking. Um, I've sort of said this before, why, why your voice is really important for your brand? Because it helps your brand be distinctive and consistent. Because it, you know, sells stuff. It makes and saves you money, time, sanity, particularly sanity. If you're an organization, an organization that needs to brief writers or sign work off, that endless going around in circles, of, oh, it just doesn't sort of feel right. We're not sort of sure. Like having a more objective way of having that conversation, super helpful. If you're a big organization, it can help change your culture. Like that shift for some of my clients, you know, a shift towards like we're quite a formal organization and by changing our writing, we're changing how we think about our customers. Um, but as I said at the start, if you're a small brand particularly, it's just a super effective way of finding ways to punch above your weight. Um, so one of the things I like, I work with clients, I also, I make a product called Voicebox, which is a sort of method for working out your tone of voice. It's called Voicebox because it comes in the box. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, so that is helpful in a way. Oh, let me stop rambling and tell you why I think about brands. Um, this is what branding is. It's Dolly Parton. She says, find out who you are, then do it on purpose, which I think is a great definition of what sussing out your brand is all about. And Voicebox is particularly a way of brands sussing out what their voice is. Because I found that working with clients is one of the most difficult things is uh, you sort of have a sense of who you are, but it's nice to know what's the full range of options. Um, and so that's what partly what Voicebox is um, about. So like I reckon there are basically sort of 11 main big brand voices. I call them the primary voices. Um, and um, I'm basically going to tell you very quickly about them now, just because that might be useful. Um, and then we'll, you, I'll give you a link at the end. There's a, a little PDF that you can have that has them all in as well. And I just found that this is a really helpful place to start because you can see what uh, the voices look like pushed in different directions, and that helps you suss out what feels most right, most authentic, most interesting uh, for your own brand. Um, I'm saying there are 11 voices because that feels about the amount that's useful. Obviously, there aren't really. Um, the, there's a statistician called George Box, and he says that all models are wrong, but some models are useful. So 11 voices, I'm in the, you know, it's wrong, but useful, I reckon. 
So voice one is the playful child. Um, the brand that most people think of when you think about tone of voice is usually innocent drinks. So they are like the archetypal example of a voice that is, you know, just playful. Like it's sort of low status, it's non-threatening, but cute and witty. Um, uh, innocent are absolutely brilliant at it. I also really like it when you see in unexpected categories. Hopefully you can see a large green plane on your screen now. This is Kalula, who is a South African budget airline. Um, and they sort of treat their airplane like it's a smoothie, like an innocent drinks a smoothie bottle. This really shouldn't work. Like the airline industry is rightly quite obsessed with safety. Um, and yet somehow it does. Fuel tanks for the go-go juice. Front door. Our door is always open unless we're at 41,000 feet. Um, if you've ever been in an airport when a Kalula plane is taxiing along the runway, everyone just goes over to the windows and starts taking photos of them. Um, and again, that is your tone of voice, like building your brand, getting, you know, building your customers, getting awareness, all of that stuff. So voice one is the playful child. Voice two uh, is the simplifier. So voices that are much more quiet and minimalist and use uh, that, uh, far fewer words. Uh, this is uh, an American pharmaceutical company called Help Remedies, who like, I've noticed my voice has changed. I'm now talking in a vo Help Remedies voice. Um, and they have a very minimal, minimalist approach to their copy. They don't even put the medical names of their products front and center on their packaging. If you think of that aisle in the supermarket, you know, where all the paracetamols and the antihistamines are and all the rest of it, it's all quite shouty. Um, help remedies are help, I can't sleep. Help, I have a headache. Help, I have an aching body. Help, I have allergies. And on the back, this is the, on the right, is the back of one of their boxes of plasters, which in America, pink plasters are called skin tone. Skin tone is not skin tone for most people. It's just some odd combo of pink and brown. Rather than take a guess at what your skin tone might be, we've left our bandages white. So also really nice bit of thinking, but the whole thing is just really calm and minimalist, works really well with their design. Um, so number one, playful child, number two, simplifier. Um, number three, energizer, a voice which is just full on. So maybe sort of Nike, Red Bull are quite sort of energetic voices. Here's a lovely example. This is from an Australian uh, thing called Pub Choir where they come and organize a choir in your pub. Pub choir explained fast. Everybody can sing and we're on a mission to prove it. Pack yourself into a pub with hundreds of strangers. Learn a song in three part harmony in 90 minutes. Perform it twice and if the publishing gods are smiling, have it immortalized in video forever. No audition, no solos, no commitments, no sheet music, no worries. Uh, like it's just full on bang, 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 bang. Um, and it's so like there's loads of really strong verbs like pack, learn, perform, like this, like bash, 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 loads of people doing things really quickly. Um, I noticed there's a brand called the Brew Tea Company who do posh loose leaf tea. who have basically taken this energizer voice and done it when talking about tea. I think it works brilliantly. This is what proper tea tastes like. Awesome tea, faff free, dust free. So the whole thing is like posh tea is normally quite sort of tea cozies and doilies and a little bit frou-frou and genteel and this is just super energetic. Um, when you buy their tea you get brew coins which are basically like you know they're sort of you know uh, free points. Brew coins what are they? Brew coins are our way of saying thanks for being a loyal tea drinker. Order tea get coins, refer, refer a friend get coins, start a subscription get coins, use them a few at a time for a discount or save them up for an even bigger splurge. Like it's just got loads of energy and movement. Terrific. Uh, Playful child, simplifier, energizer. Uh, what's next? Purposeful voice. So I feel like I've shown you quite a lot of stuff, which is doing lots of different things, which is also quite funny. Um, some brands really do well with that serious gravitas. Um, I think this is really interesting. So this is from Tesco, just at the start of the pandemic last year. Um, so before any governments had got their messaging together, and people were sort of looking out for like a voice of reassurance. Tesco did a really nice job of being a sort of national voice of reassurance. Together, we can do this. It's fair to say that we find ourselves in uncharted waters. 
COVID-19 is bringing a change to the UK and it's clear that lots of things are going to have to shift around in order to help us cope. At Tesco we have been doing everything we can to keep business as usual but we have to accept it is not business as usual. Now, it's just got really serious gravitas at the same time like a really safe pair of hands. Um, I think what, so Tesco is a client of mine I think what's really interesting about this is they couldn't have done this a few years ago because this would have come out quite formal or corporate but there's something about that mix of sort of warmth and absolute seriousness which I think they've got really nicely. Um, where are we? Purposeful. Let's do straight talker. So straight talker is like the Ron Seal voice. Uh, you know, it's it's Ron Seal's five year weather shield wood stain. It lasts for five years and it stains your wood. Um, again, I really like seeing it in unexpected categories. There's a Swiss private bank, very posh, uh, that has the Ron Seal voice. They're called Hyper Swiss. I absolutely love this. It'll never be about you and us. It will always be about your money. Hyper Swiss private bank, expect the expected. Um, and I think this is like, A, this is absolutely brilliant because it makes you realize that all banks have just defaulted to trying to be your best friend, that that is just what banks try and do now. Um, so to play against that type suddenly makes you stand out. But I think it's a great thought experiment for any brand. Like what? What would you say if you spoke the absolute truth to your customers just to see what would come out? Like we just we so often fall into like, we'll uh, you know, I'll be nice or I'll be persuasive or I'll be interesting. And all these things are great. But actually, what happens if you just speak really, really plainly? Straight talker, warm friend is the next one. So completely unthreatening, natural, nice, safe voice um, again. So this is a plumber, that plumber. Um, and I think this again, this is a really nice spot that normally plumbers are quite blokey. Uh, but actually, what happens if you are the completely unthreatening, nice, warm friend plumber? That plumber's name is Carl, a one man pipework professional ready to work wonders on your kitchen, bathroom, or central heating. I'm based in the Wirral, blah, 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 blah. I probably worked on your neighbours' homes and maybe even yours before you lived there. Imagine that. Uh, anyway, I'll stop going on because you've got a job that needs doing. Right. We sort of expect this warm friend voice from certain types of brand. Again, really nicely in a slightly unusual place. Firestarter, brands that deliberately try and provoke and get a reaction. Um, like probably the most famous of these at the moment is Brewdog. Like Brewdog are brilliant at being deliberately a bit annoying. Because um, again, maybe not as extreme as the guy with his cheese van, but you know, they happy to put off as many people as they attract. Um, somebody sent me this the other day, which I love. It's from um, an American woman called Ash Amberge, who does sort of kick ass coaching for women. Uh, give them the whole thing is called the middle finger project. Give the middle finger, the middle finger to the things you're supposed to do. When your life feels like one giant to do list full of tasks you're checking off to make other people people feel happy. You're faking the fuck out of your smiles and your orgasms. Give the middle finger to the predictable but boring path. Turns out a sensible pair of pantyhose and knowing exactly what time the garbage gets collected every week does not make for a life well lived. Basically, brands that are happy to swear at you. I think that is the divide. Like if you're comfortable swearing at your customers, like you've got a load of potential. Doesn't work for every brand, does work for some. We're nearly there. I've forgotten how many we've got to. Um, Completely opposite to the fire starter is the neutralizer voice, like the voice that is so transparent and unassuming, it's completely invisible. Uh, Gov.uk is probably the world's best example of this. You know, it has no opinion, no personality, no anything at all to draw attention to itself. Um, I spoke to the woman, Sarah Richards, who ran the team that did this, like helped pull hundreds of government websites together. Um, and sorted out the voice and she was like look nobody comes to a government website to be inspired or entertained or for any good reason they come because there's a problem to sort out or they owe the government money you cannot make an assumption about what they're thinking and feeling you cannot do anything you know anything at all like that so you just have to be completely invisible um, I recently had to use this page, register the death. There's not even a, you know, sorry for this, at this difficult time, sorry for your loss. There's nothing at all. Register the death within five days, eight in Scotland. This includes weekends and back holidays. Before you can register the death, you will need either. It's completely plain and simple. Um, 
and I think what's really interesting is they work just as hard. You know, they've got big teams, they have tone of voice documents, they've got the process and the sign off. They work just as hard to take all the personality out of the words and get this consistent as a brand like BrewDog or Innocent is doing to get loads of personality in. Um, really fascinating. Uh, I've got two more, maybe three. The sensualist. So not just sensualism, sensualist as in like sexy sensualist, but like brands that are deliberately about evoking all of your senses, sight, feel, sound, touch, and smell. Um, this is Pucker Tease. It's almost like a sort of guided meditation. Imagine a sun-drenched orchard where you dance with delight as cinnamon tree branches swirl overhead. One moment, a jive of ginger root and spicy clove. So it's like really, it's like poetry. So brands that really lean in to that poetic voice. I think that is really interesting. Um, a slight cheat category is the impersonator, but works brilliantly if you need a tone of voice really quickly, is what tone of voice can you steal from culture? So like there's a massive amount of hipster brands that just go, right, we'll sound like Victorian gentlemen. This is um, a, a corn snack brand called Hip Peas, who have just gone for it, right, well, let's just sound like the 60s peace and love voice, power to the people, peas love and giving back. Um, like who else does it really good? Hendrix Gin are just a lovely sort of Edwardian Alice in Wonderland type voice. And it's brilliant because you only need a few words of it and you pick up on it instantly. Uh, there's a, there's a, um, a removals company in London called White Van Gentleman, which like just with that one word, gentleman, and a logo that is a little bit Victorian, they've created a whole brand instantly, like, absolutely brilliantly. So it's super effective. Like just what voice is already out there that you can borrow. And they're very, very finally, uh, like Jack Daniels, storytellers. Uh, loads of brands tell stories. Uh, some brands are sort of built around stories. Their voice comes out of stories. Um, Jack Daniels are, are sort of absolute masters of telling stories about absolutely everything uh, because they've got such great things to go on as well. Because not only have they got Jack Daniels himself as a character, Lynchburg, Tennessee, uh, the place where they make it, distill it. Um, it's just absolutely rich in stories. It's a dry county. Uh, so, you know, the place they uh, distill and supply the world with uh, whiskey uh, you can't actually drink it which is like absolute gold dust for a brand like how weird and brilliant is that um, right I've talked really fast at you I can't remember what's going to be on this last slide um, so I think this is the opportunity obviously you know it's part of making your brand really consistent and distinctive if you're working for smaller brands um, make a boring thing sing put words in unexpected places uh, give things unusual names uh, like, or, you know, use just one word, like uh, home things with the word bonkers. Brew Tea Company uh, really own this idea of whole rolled leaves. They've just made that up, but it sounds really posh and lovely. Um, so I think I'm going to stop talking now and throw it over to you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Um, that was as... Uh, it silly and insightful as I hoped it would be. Um, I have one quick question just while everyone else is starting to think about what questions they might want to put into the chat and I'm encouraging people to do that right now if you can but in the meantime I wanted to ask you talked a little bit about the different kind of the key brand voices um, why do you think there have been so many inappropriate innocent impersonators? Um well, because lots of lots of brands don't really know what they're about. You know, it's quite hard to, you know, figure all that stuff out in detail. And then, like, it's really beguiling, isn't it? Like, funny is really attractive and making people laugh is really attractive. And then if you see a, another brand over there making people laugh and getting all the attention, you want to be like that as well. Um, and so, you know, and so I can see why it's really attractive because it's a, like, it feels like a quick win. Oh, you know, we'll be funny and everyone will love us. Um, but it's, <laughs> it is mad the amount of brands who call me up and go, oh, can you make us sound more like innocent still even now? And I have to go, no, because, well, you're a nuclear waste disposal company. That would be a disaster. <laughs> but oh, figure no. out what's right for you. Yeah. Also, copywriters really like it as well, don't they? Like, 
if you don't rein in a copywriter, we'll just default to funny because it's a way of seeing that you've done good work. If you can make somebody laugh, it's like, oh, I've got reaction. Good. It's like a it's like quick test of, oh, that worked. We've got some questions in. Um, I'll ask the first one and then Amanda can maybe pick up after that. Um, so this one's from Lorraine Small. Do you base your brand on your own personality or the personality you hope the business to have? Mm. Um, I think you can do either. If you're a small business, which is a lot about you, um, it's like, I guess, like the most effective thing is it like it's you, but amplified, isn't it? Like definitely Ash, Ash Amberge is like that in person. She is gobby and forthright and swears a lot. So it would be mad for her to build a brand that is sort of more uh, calmer or mannered. But like she's really turned it up. Like, so that everything you read of hers is basically swearing at you and shouting at you and very funny. Um, so, yeah, like, it's like, what if you, like, if there is something about you and your personality which you feel like, actually, if I turn that up, that is super distinctive and interesting. Absolutely brilliant. Um, um, here's a question uh, from Frank, and it's, um, I suppose, going right back to the start. He's saying, how do you start to create a tone of voice for a brand? And maybe you've given us a bit of insight into that, Nick, with your with your voice box today. So hopefully, maybe you could expand on that. So I think you're you're putting together and like I, when I'm working with clients, I'm putting together a number of clues. So there is like, you know, <laughs> what sort of brand are they? Like broadly speaking, no, that's not that's not right. So what sort of brand are they? And what do they say about themselves? What are their values? Um, like that stuff. You know, if it is a sort of bold, confident brand, it is likely that we're going to need a bold, confident voice. Then there's whatever's going on in your category. I think that is really important. You know, if you are a luxury brand, say, what are all other luxury brands doing? What are your competitors doing? And then you can either make a decision there about, right, so we better do that as well, or we better do the opposite or something different. You know, I think that's really interesting about Brew Tea Company is they have looked and seen so posh tea but tea is usually talked about in a sort of disposable way you know i'll have put the kettle on we'll have a brew a lovely cuppa so they have decided you know they've cut all of that language so they've noticed what language is used about their product generally so you will never see them use the word cuppa um, and then they've noticed what other posh tea brands are doing and it feels a bit refined and mannered so they're not going to do that either they're going to find a different way i sort of think that's that's quite often what you're looking for is that mix of you know where's the opportunity so what's distinctive and interesting about us as a brand you know and that clue might come from our personalities people our product or proposition you know our visual identity you know just like help remedies like really works because their packaging is super minimalist as well so a calm minimalist voice helps make the most of that um, and then what else is going on in your market? And then, you know, there might be just really practical constraints. Like what is, what is quick and easy to do? Um, there's a brand called Starface, which I absolutely love, which are basically like teenage acne products. And so there's a whole beautiful thing about their positioning, which is they're not a health product. You, they, you know, they don't have the language of God, what was the one? Clearasil, I used when I was a teenager. So they've got rid of all the medically stuff and they've got rid of all the sort of worthiness and they basically write in sort of text speak. And it's brilliant because they just churn this stuff out because it's like, it's a really sort of offhand, casual way of talking. Works really well for them. Mm. Yeah. I'm, perfect. I'm perfect for their target audience. They just, yeah, yeah. They just straight on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, Nick. Uh, we've got in we have a few more questions coming in now so we'll rattle through these to keep an eye on our time um timothy has said he's not brave enough i'm not sure if he means to ask a question there or if that was <laughs> um william, do it, timothy. <laughs> william has said can sub brands have wildly divergent personality or better to have consistent voice over disparate parts e.g nescafe versus nespresso um I think it all depends on the positioning and what you're doing. Um, 
if the if you're meant to see a connection between the sub brand and the main brand, uh, it just gets really complicated if there's lots of different voices. Like again, Tesco, I think have, have got really good at this. Like it is the same voice for Tesco as Tesco Mobile and Tesco Bank and all of those things, and they don't complicate it by having different personalities. But Nescafe and Nespresso, like literally, I'm only just realising they're the same parent company like they're totally different propositions and they should feel completely different i think yeah it's the halfway house that is difficult like trying to give a brand its own distinctive personality but also make it sound like the parent brand i think that's probably just messy like keep it simple and have mainly one voice here's here's an interesting one as well um from connor is we are a company who are exclusive distributor for four established well-known brands. We are struggling to push out these brands and products with and our own company's brand. So they've basically, I suppose, like they're the distributors, but they're also a brand in their own right. Um, any advice on this type of scenario? Ha! No, that just sounds really hard, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, I mean, with, without knowing more about, you know, what channels and what opportunities you've got. Um, yeah, no, that just, that it just is hard. I think that's oh, William has also just added in the uh, Nest Quick, so that's another one within that uh, within the, the Nest Cafe. Uh, that's hilarious, area, right. which is another yeah. one again, isn't it? The sort of yeah. milkshake, horrible drinks. And Connor has said it sure is, yeah. So um, just recognizing that it's a tricky enough um, yeah. scenario. That I suppose one one way they could do that is. It, you know, I suppose then what they're trying to do is shine a light on others, and maybe that's a little bit of their um, partly what what they could, you know, their brand could be around that idea that they're there, that they're a help, they're kind of like a someone that is there to shine a light on others and to to kind of give that support to others. Or, but yeah, it is. It's definitely a tricky one. Yeah, and looking for you know where are the where are the points of maximum opportunity that you're, you know, if you're sort of essentially involved in a process, like what are the invisible bits of the process that you can really sort of make, suddenly make interesting or better or, yeah. you know, you know, yeah. And that could even be, you know, just the smallest messages around the process of logistics or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've got a final, I think in terms of time, we've got one final question here. It's from Rosie and she has said, is it possible to have a voice which will hit millennials as much as Gen Z? Um, remind me which is which. <laughs> <laughs> High five on this. I, I don't really believe in those categories. Like, Starface are for like 13 and 14 year old TikTok users and I can see that their voice like is very text to speak. But I'm 48 and I read it and I think that's amazing and it's cool and interesting. Like if you've got interesting things to say and a confident enough voice, like just it cuts across everybody. You know, I just, I've been doing some work recently with Saga. So they're technically for the over 50s, but you know, most of their customers are over 70s. And like like they're you know, just as tech savvy, just as interested and engaged, you know, cultural references, you know, it's like, it's just all up for grabs now. We're all brand savvy, really. It's my sweeping generalization. <laughs> And a good point to, to end things on, I think. A great, uh, a great ending uh, comment. Um, that's all. We've, we've covered all the questions, which is great. And there's some people adding their thanks there um, to you, Nick. Uh, Amazing. Shall I just say that if you want that um, thingy, Bob, so there's a PDF of the 11 primary voices that you can read slightly slower than I rushed through it. Uh, if you sign up to my newsletter, which is journalofmessythinking.com, uh, you'll get a link for that. Um, I'm genuinely not here to flog Voicebox, uh, but if you do want it, you can get it at discount because uh, you've seen it here. The code is 500 and that gets it for 500 quid instead of 600. Um, so that's just there if that's useful for you. Um, yeah, so I think that's our time is up. Um, I want to say thanks very much, Nick, for um 
coming over and well com literally coming <laughs> not literally I should say uh, but joining us um, on Zoom and it's been really interesting um, and hopefully everybody else has got something out of it. The comments, I must say, are have been really positive. Um, someone has uh, said, love this, thanks so much. Hopefully you get a chance there, Nick, to have a quick look yourself at the comments because they're really positive. Oh, magic, thank you. Good yeah. fun. Um, yeah, so thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I hope you find this uh, a useful session and get a chance to look up some of the um, extra, some of the, the links there that, that Nick has posted. Um, yeah, so that's us for today. Thanks a million. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.